this morning, I'd like to introduce someone who probably doesn't need much of an introduction to this group, but one of our senior distinguished uh, plastic surgeons, uh, Dr. Lee Pu, who has many disclosures. I just I realized that that almost gives your introduction right there, Dr. Pu, uh, has been a prolific contributor to the uh, plastic surgery uh, literature. And uh, we're glad to have you back again for your annual uh, grand rounds for the Department of Surgery. So thank you. Good morning. And uh, as we know, uh, at UC Davis, we do a lot of uh, very complex uh, surgical procedures. So today, I'm going to talk about the, the role of microvascular uh, free tissue transfer in complex reconstruction. This is something that, uh, you know, obviously as a plastic surgeon, uh, we do a fairly amount here. So this is my disclosures. I published uh, quite a few books and uh, I have received a, a royalties uh, from a publisher. Microvascular free transfer is really revolutionized reconstructed plastic surgery. And uh, as you know, in plastic surgery, we use a, a reconstruction ladder as a kind of way to decide which uh, uh, which uh, uh, way we should do in terms of the best for the patient. Uh, free tissue transfer is on the top of the reconstruction the ladder. And the overall success rate uh, these days is about either somewhere from uh, 95 to uh, to nine, 99 percent, but never been 100 percent. This is something that. And also, it's all, all, very often you can achieve a much better reconstruction outcome, but, but sometimes uh, that can be the only option for certain reconstructions. Uh, this is actually what we call the reconstructed surgery elevator, you can see here. If you take a, this, is, this is an elevator, uh, th this is kind of regional ladder, it goes this way. The elevator is go from, just go straight to the free tissue transfer. This is something that, uh, that for this talk uh, is pretty much focused on the reconstructed surgery elevator. Uh, in terms of my own clinical experience, uh, I never had a, a formal microsurgery follow-up training. Whatever I got, it usually is uh, based on my residency training as well as my 18 years of clinical practice after a uh, plastic residency. And I felt myself become a competent microsurgeon with very good success and also and, uh, and often can uh, perform a state-of-art free tissue transfer, uh, sometimes can, uh, dealing with very difficult or challenging cases uh, in reconstructive plastic surgery. Uh, this is actually a publication uh, 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 I have done in the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, and obviously, many of uh, our formal, uh, for, former resident and also current resident involved the uh, scientific publication in the series. And this is actually the, uh, my own contribution for free to transfer is primarily in lower extremity. And this is a book I published in 2013. And this book actually got the, the best uh, uh, the illustration awards from the American Association of Medical Illustrators. Yeah, so this is a, what I think is a, the, the way to approach a microvascular free tissue transfer. I think it's about summarizing the 10 important considerations. A lot of uh, trainees, they think of um, uh, microvascular free transfer, free tissue transfer, only microvascular anastomosis is important. I'll tell you, this is something, the 10 important uh, uh, considerations from patient selection, flap selection, uh, you know, down to the selection of recipient vessels, uh, flap selection, flap dissection, microvascular anastomosis, flap inset, immediate post-op care, intermediate post-op care, and also follow-up care. So I'll tell you, any of this kind of a step could go wrong, could go wrong. That's kind of a problem for microsurgery. It's, a, it's not a just the intra of microvascular anastomosis. This is something that and uh, I'll tell you, and uh, I really learned the hard way, yeah. So this is something we'll summarize in this uh, special topic article published PRS Global uh, Open. Yeah. So I'll start a patient selection. You know, besides the, the important the major risk of any surgical patient, this is something we actually occasionally will encounter is a hypercoagulant state. So I'll tell you, once you have this kind of patient, if you are not doing anything, regardless how good you are as a microsurgeon, uh, it, it won't work for free tissue transfer. So it's, this is something that you have to recognize. This is, this is a, a, one of the uh, issues in terms of patient selection. Yeah. In terms of flap selection, they always to go for you know soft tissue requirement. What's the availability of flap from this patient? And also importantly, is that surgeons you know you have to know the certain flap very well. Usually we know a few <coughs> flap quite quite well. You can just go for it. And uh, and also you had to assess the adequate uh, pedicle length in terms of size of pedicle. 
And uh, in my, this is my philosophy, I try not to uh, uh, use vein graft, always avoid the vein graft because it adds on more complexity. So it, usually when I use the vein graft, that means that somehow and uh, it is a failure of sort of pre-op kind of a, a, a planning. And also you obviously have considered minimal donor side mobility, so sometimes it reconstruct the results. Uh, how to select recipient vessels? So this is something, it's not just simple just to evaluate the artery. So I'll tell you, you really have to pay attention to both artery and the vein, okay? So the vein is much more difficult to assess. Uh, you know, and, uh, and I try to do end-to-end uh, -end anastomosis as possible because end-to-end -end anastomosis is much easier than end-to-side technically. And so it's always a po a possible for head and neck or breast, but sometimes it's possible for upper extremity or lower extremities. This is something that you have to keep that in mind. And sometimes you had to create the receiving vessel. I'll show you what that means. And so, for example, this is the patient I'm looking for the uh, 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 recipient vessels, and uh, you can see a duplex scan shows they're looking for facial artery and the vein. So artery, you can feel the pulsation, but vein, you cannot assess it. However, based on duplex scan, you can see that's a good vein. So this is something that gives you a, a kind of a, kind of more security, so you can go for this kind of uh, receiving site. And uh, in terms of flap dissections, I usually want to know as much uh, uh, a, a, as much as possible in terms of vascular anatomy flap. This is particularly true for periphery flap. We're dealing with much smaller vessels, and uh, and some people use the CT angio. I prefer to use duplex scan. And uh, for all the periphery flap, I try to map the perforator before I even start dissection. And uh, this is a very true for a lot of time for ALT flap, and DIAP, and sometimes for even freestyle free flap. It's very important. For example, this is actually the uh, I I usually ask a vascular uh, t a tech company OR. So we'll do some kind of a mapping and then the, in the OR while patients sleep. And you can see here, this is something we, I map the perforator of ALT flaps. So something that you know before you even go in. And uh, in terms of flap dissection, this is something you, you, we don't really learn how to do flap dissection is really from a, a distal to proximal. This is some of the traditional ways. I found it's much easier if you can kind of do from both directions. From You can sometimes go to proximal to, to distal, and uh, this is much quicker. You uh, join in the middle, so you'll finish your pedicle dissection. Uh, in terms of flat preparation, and, uh, and uh, I usually use a higher concentration of hyperanacin. This is a higher, it means that 10 times higher, usually normal hyperanacillin in, in the hospital, in the OR, the 10 unit per cc. And uh, so we try to uh, fl uh, 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 basically flush the hyperanacillin into the uh, microvascular system. So you can imagine the endocellular will bind your heparin. This is something, that's a kind of concept. Uh, and, uh, and also I, I try to use a pedicle, uh, a prepared pedicle vessel on the loop dissection as best I can. That's actually more faster. And, uh, and uh, usually for free flap surgery, we do not do a systemic anticoagulation at all. So this is just a, pretty much just a, just a lo uh, uh, local and uh, anticoagulation. So I'll we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time about the microvascular anastomosis. I'll tell you, this is something, as a surgeon, you can control the pace. If you cannot control anything else, this is something I think you should control. For example, after very intense pedicle dissection and uh, flap dissection, uh, recipient vessel dissection, I think that you should take a little break. This is something that what I learned is like, uh, you want to be very fresh and able to do microvascular uh, anastomosis just one time down. Okay, so once you start revising, add sutures, et cetera, et cetera, it's gonna be a nightmare because the vessel is so small. And also think about the physiology of a patient. You let, uh, you let flap rest in a little because you've been twisting the flap during dissection, the flap is maybe not perfused very well. And also you let, you let the recipient vessel dilate a little bit, put the perforins, uh, and get everything kind of optimal and before you even do the anastomosis. So basis, you, and, and also ask anesthesiologist to correct hypothermia or hypervolemic anything and uh, uh, if, uh, if a patient has, because for a long case, sometimes a patient may not have kind of issue. So what I try to say is that, so everything's optimal, you start to do microvascular anastomosis. The surgery is a little bit more, uh, you know, fresh, and the, and the, and the flap and the, and the recipient vessels, the patient, everything's optimal, and you start doing microvascular anastomosis. And uh, I usually take quite a t some time and uh, try to do some sort of setup. And, uh, and I try to use this like a double arm kind of clamp. Some sort of do not use it. You can see it's a very nice uh, kind of setup. If you do the end to side anastomosis, you, re you really have to do the arteriotomy and uh, to make it a little bigger, a little bigger. The, so this is something you, uh, you can facilitate the, the end to side anastomosis. I, I tend to use a much fewer uh, a number of sutures. I, and if possible, I only use eight old sutures. I'll show you. For example, this is the 
uh, like about two millimeter end-to-end -end, uh, 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 arterial anastomosis, you can see here, set up very nicely, and I add exactly, this, this is on the microscope, okay, so something, I add exactly like a, 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 a six sutures, so side to side, two in the front, flip, the other two in the front, down. So this is very precisely get it down. So you actually, this is something that you, and, uh, you can see, and uh, this is the way it look like on the microscope. In terms of the venous anastomosis, we pretty much use copper device now. So I haven't used the uh, hand saw since 2004. And uh, this is something that's relatively easy to learn and uh, it has very good patency rate. And, uh, and uh, so most important thing is make a venous anastomosis no longer struggling because it's sometimes in teaching hospital, you work with the resident fellows, and they feel that venous anastomosis you always struggle. So this is something you don't have to struggle anymore. So it's just pretty standard and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and also there's a, one advantage use of venous coupler device is that there's an external ring. This ring can prevent the uh, external uh, 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 compression for the venous anastomosis. This is something that's very important. Yeah. What happens once you release a clamp? This is something that in a, sometimes you will see some bleeding. Uh, however, in a, in a early, my preference, I try not to add any suture unless it's a true high flow bleeding, bleeding early from internal memory artery. That's a high flow bleeding. Otherwise, I try not to really add any suture. Just put a little gauze, wrap around the anastomosis, and, and, and let the bleeding stop. For example, sometimes the vessel condition is terrible. This patient had a very bad uh, atherosclerosis. And it, imagine you add sutures, and it will basically tear the vessels. And also, this is the endocyte anastomosis. This vessel is very small. You add sutures, you basically occlude the uh, anastomosis. So this is something that's a really good, uh, sort of ju good uh, uh, judgment and, and how uh, whether you should add the sutures. So. And in terms of how to uh, evaluate the, the patency of a microvascular anastomosis, sometimes we can use a spy. And besides clinical kind of examination, you can use a spy. And also, uh, the spy can actually uh, uh, assess the, uh, the both arterial venous anastomosis and also can assess the flat perfusion. This is something you can think about if you want to use it. Yeah. In terms of flat inside, and uh, you really have to avoid any compression to the microvascular anastomosis. And this is something uh, over the year. Uh, what I will try to do is a horizontal match of suture. This is something to get very so secure and also very, very kind of cosmetic, pleasing kind of closure. This is the muscle flap. This is like fascial cutaneous flap. And uh, you try to close suction drain, uh, really, really uh, uh, avoid the direct suction to the microvascular micro 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 anastomosis. And the flap inside, and uh, this is something, and uh, we usually actually start, start using cooked Doppler device, and uh, this is uh, this is something. Uh, once you wrap around the arterial anastomosis, when you do flap inside, once you put any extra tension to the flap, the, the you know, signal will change. This is that something that gave you some some a very good kind of a, a indication. So this is a very true for DIP flap reconstruction, and uh, this is something that's really really helpful. Besides just clinical observation in the past. This is what we do in the past, yeah. Uh, in terms of post-op care, and, uh, and each uh, vascular, uh, the uh, microsurgery, you develop some kind of standard protocol. This is actually the protocol I uh, developed. Uh, you uh, usually use aspirin. Uh, dextrin usually is for, only for free uh, peripheral flaps only. And you have to keep patient warm, well hydrated, good pain control, and also uh, keep the flap side warm as well to prevent the uh, vasospasm. spans. And these days, uh, we actually pretty much use a uh, continue the cooked Doppler uh, the monitoring to replace clinical and, uh, and uh, a routine Doppler kind of a, uh, a flap check. And also, there's always a PT OT issue. This is something that to determine the surgeon's decision. Yeah. And uh, this is actually an example. So we finished the micro the, the free flap reconstruction. This is a DIP flap. So this is a cooked Doppler. So you can actually hear the sounds. It's constantly you leave that for about five days. So day five, you take it out. So much easier. And, uh, and uh, to monitor this kind of patient. So if patient doing well, and uh, you know, I don't think a patient really need to go to ICU, probably just go some kind of step down units and with a, a, a well-trained nursing staff. Uh, Sometimes during the immediate post-op, this is something, and uh, if, you, if you have any doubt about uh, anything, like say flap does not look good, sometimes uh, maybe a, a question about some kinking or compression, something, you should not hesitate to explore the, the, uh, the, uh, the microvascular anastomosis and make sure really nothing kind of a, a compression, the kinking, et cetera, et cetera. 
and uh, and uh, what what I'm hoping is uh, sometimes you, you might be able we might be able to use some kind of uh, uh, like uh, non-invasive studies at the bedside to assess this kind of situation. However, as a surgeon, if you're not happy about the, uh, something about flab about the uh, about the Doppler sound, et cetera, et cetera. You really think about it more aggressively to explore the patient. Yeah. Uh, issue on anticoagulation. So this is very critical yearly for the first uh, three days. And uh, once again, for, for, for most routine uh, uh, free flap uh, as a surgeon, we do not do any hyper, uh, systemic hybridization. So we all depend on local perfusion and aspirin, uh, sometimes dextrin. And, and all, this is also what we, we need because we're dealing with relatively normal uh, vessels. Uh, for lower extremity, uh, you have a dangling protocol. This is something that you, once you have a flap, patient can, you have a tolerance kind of protocol before a patient can go home. This is, this is something that uh, is, and, uh, and uh, each surgeon has a little bit different preference. In general, about uh, two weeks, the patient should actually dangling and should be able to tolerate about 40, uh, 20 minutes so the patient can go home because you feel like the patient is kind of safe and put a foot down in tw uh, for about 20 minutes, yeah. Uh, in terms of follow-up care, and, uh, and we're always uh, 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 dealing with sometimes the, the revision. The revision timing-wise, you already wait about six months. And for the extreme, you can use a strap to reduce the swelling. And uh, for muscle flap, you do tangents. You can take out extra tissue and do additional skin graft. And for the fascial kidney flap, you already do liposuction and also do skin resection, take out extra skin. And this is something to for uh, revision surveys. For example, this is actually a uh, free flap, free muscle flap to the uh, for the ankle. You can see here, very bulky. You do tangent excision, take out the extra uh, uh, flap tissue, and do another skin graft. You can get a very nice contour, and for the for the even for the foot. So I'm going to talk, uh, uh, give you about 15 case of demonstration to uh, so, uh, the, uh, about the, the role of the free tissue transfer in complex reconstruction. All the cases were performed in the last 12 years here at UC Davis. You can see a pretty extent from head to, to toe. And also, and, uh, and in this case here, you can actually, uh, pictures uh, you can actually feel is is a lot of hard work, long hours, and I appreciate all our, our resident and uh, and uh, and the sometimes the faculty and uh, to cross color each other. And there's a lot of work to get this kind of uh, work done. So uh, and also there's a uh, many services actually got involved in this case series: orthopedic surgery, oncology, thoracic surgery, trauma surgery, general surgery, and neurosurgery. This is actually the service that got involved for this case series. Yeah. So the first case is scalp reconstruction. This patient had, had a, a advanced uh, squamous cell cancer, relatively older guy, and uh, the surgical oncology did a wide local excision, take out uh, the scalp, and and uh, and the neurosurgeon actually removed a portion of the scalp, and also uh, for, unfortunately they entered to the dura, they actually repaired the dura. So this is something where we got as a plastic surgeon. So for this case, uh, and, uh, I did, I did I, the, a large ALT flap, 20 by 10 centimeter, and a nice dissection ALT flap, and and uh, and it's most to the superficial temporal artery and the vein right here. It's pretty uh, rather straightforward if you have a good vessel here. And this is a cranioplasty used a, a titanium mesh to reconstruct the scalp, and uh, then the flap on the top. And uh, they can see here, this is actually the uh, result on the table, and this is about five, six weeks later. So this is such a nice reconstruction for scalp reconstruction. Uh, this is a patient that uh, had a really uh, de deglavid, I'll tell you. And, uh, and the, when the case presented to me, I was actually uh, uh, attending an international meeting, and among them, I got an uh, email from my chief resident and said, she said, Dr. Pu, do you think this patient you may need a face transplant? This is something that pretty, uh, you can see here, that, uh, uh, basically a uh, shape almost half size of the face. You can see the uh, uh, loss of zygomatic arches, the bony part, a little bit of like a zygoma. So for this patient, the first uh, stage we did, I did, uh, uh, we did uh, 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 reconstruction kind of a zygomatic arch. We used the the the, uh, the, uh, the basically the, the plate to bend a certain way, and also we use a medical implant uh, the, and the, like a so it kind of surface almost like a bone, bone graft sort of things, and uh, and to kind of contour the mid face, and then and and the soft tissue reconstruction. This is actually a large ALT flap for soft tissue reconstruction. So this is actually the result after initial kind of a, a soft tissue coverage and also facial scar to reconstruction. You can see the results. 
And then uh, this patient has a, a, a lot of issues of second stage. Uh, what I did, I did a resuscitation of the flap, and I did a lateral cancel paxi to lift up the uh, lower eyelid. And uh, you can see this is the result uh, immediate, immediate uh, the intra op, and this is the result after a resuscitation ALT flap and lateral cancel paxi, getting, gradually getting better. And then, uh, so, so this patient has a little bit of lower eyelid issues. So, so for what you learn, so you augment mid phase, you can actually improve the lower eyelid kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, laxity as you can see here. I use a medical implant did a, a mid phase uh, augmentation and, the, uh, and also did a lateral cancel plus to resend the lateral cancer again. And this is the results uh, after the above surgery. It's getting a little better. You can see the position of lower eyelid is actually getting better and better. And uh, however, this patient had facial nerve injuries. Get, the patient had that has a lower eyelid paralysis. No, have no muscle function. That's the problem. And uh, then, uh, so the uh, stage four. So we did a, a hairline, uh, 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 hairline reconstruction. Basically, yeah. just uh, uh, did a, put a tissue expander here and expand the scalp like this. Like the patient literally sometimes looks like a monster, so like this. And then you actually resect this part of flap and we advance this uh, scalp and uh, to, uh, to restore the hairline. So this is actually all after kind of all the uh, re uh, reconstructions. And so you can see here, the patients at the really decent result. However, the, uh, the skin color of the flap still kind of uh, not very good. So this is kind of a, 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 the last kind of risky, op risky operation I did for this patient, just to do operation to improve the color match. And uh, this is what we did is I actually skin graft the epidermal skin, very thin skin from scalp. And then this is the way you can uh, de epithelial the flap put a very thin skin, uh, 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 epidermal skin graft, and this is a way to improve the color of the, of the flaps. This is actually a better color. So, so this is the final results after like almost 24 months, 25 months kind of efforts for this patient since the uh, initial injury. Uh, this is a patient, another uh, extends, and uh, so, so he had a self-inflated uh, uh, gunshot wound, you can see here. This is a patient that came to a hospital like this. You can see here on the uh, 3D CT scans, basically below the entire uh, the central portion of the lower and mid face, all completely gone. Uh, this is something obviously a very ch a ch challenging in terms of reconstruction. And uh, so this patient uh, initially uh, managed by my associate to uh, uh, do the initial wound debridement, put some plate that restored the bony uh, 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 a, a, a structure, and uh, this is the patient, uh, and had uh, like a 3D model. You can actually based on CT scan get a 3D model to see uh, where the plates are. Uh, uh, are this is this is a, this is a new technology. Yeah. So for this patient, and uh, uh, initially, uh, and uh, you know what I'm thinking about is restore the facial spot of its plate. And and uh, and and also you soft tissue cover the uh, open wound, also also the plate. And in this way, you can actually get a healed wound, and then the patient will be able to go home. And uh, this is something I think about: what will be next? And it's going to be so. Uh, since this uh, injury was so extensive, and I actually uh, uh, talked to this patient about what about the potential face transplant? Is that an option for the patient? And, uh, and they were shocked to hear that kind of a. Kind of a, kind of a, a recommendations, and uh, and what happened was that we had uh, the, and with the help of the resident, we did a lot of kind of a, a communication with the patient that makes patients realize face transplant might be the option because they, they they had a kind of a little high expectation they want to looks normal. This is something that anyway. So so this for this patient uh, after a, a bony reconstruction with a plate and I put a, a, a ALT flat to cover the mid face wound and also expose plate. For the, for the lower face, I did the, uh, we did a superclavicular flap, it's a local flap, and, uh, and uh, to cover. So this is actually the result on the table of the first operation. You can imagine how long the operation would take. And unfortunately, this patient had lost this pedicle flap, and because it might be some uh, unique uh, uh, blood supply issues to, to, the, to, the, to the local flap. And I, and I say, I couldn't believe why it, it did not work. So I tried the second, uh, the, the contralateral side did the same thing. This time I did not uh, 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 make a, a sub tunnel. It's actually, actually the flap is actually really just a kind of a, 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 a outside to cover the lower, lower, uh, uh, lower mandible. And this, we lost this, this flap again. So this is something that uh, we uh, left us. So we have to, really have to do something to push the envelope. And uh, so uh, we decided to do a second free tissue transfer. So we did a second ALT flap to cover. And this is this, this, this is this kind of result. Imagine this patient. What I did is all skin flap, skin flap plate. 
I did not ha harvest or compromise any of his major donor side if, uh, if he was uh, going to have a kind of a conventional reconstruction. So all what I did is try to uh, pre prepare this uh, patient for, for future possible face transplants. This is something, if he could have a healed wound, then he was able to go home. So, you know, and so, however, we do leave one of the problem is because of saliva kind of really kind of soak into the uh, suture lines of the flap decays, I had to do a uh, 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 reclosure and, uh, and, uh, and uh, something. And, uh, but unfortunately, this has become a, uh, became a constant problem. And this is, the, see, uh, what we, we got and in terms of what we finished about the, like uh, uh, eight operations in total and, uh, and he stayed in the hospital almost like a, a five months. And uh, so you can see he restored the facial scalp and everything, everything. So this is actually a healed wound. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and he's actually with his mask made able to go out a little bit of baseball and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So this patient actually later on uh, that transferred to the NYU and he did have a face transplant. You can see this is like a little cartoon kind of thing that they did. See how they take out, uh, take out this kind of a, a portion of the face and uh, this is the donor side. Of, they find it exactly, uh, the, the donor side matches unbelievably good in terms of the age, skin color, and even the hairstyle. Everything is so perfect to match. And, and, uh, and you can see here, this is another tattoo. This is where they did a, a face transplant in uh, January 2018. And uh, so this is actually the result before and after published. And uh, imagine, this is probably, uh, in, my, in our opinion, it's the best result ever in the history of medicine. So this is an unbelievable result. <laughs> and uh, and uh, for, to, 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 re to reconstruct from this and to this. And uh, so this is something that is uh, really uh, amazing. And, uh, and I'll help you, uh, if patient is continue to take uh, immunosuppression, and uh, he might be okay, okay, as a normal person, yeah. So this is actually the case uh, that was featured at ABC Sunday, and you can see here briefly, and, uh, and, Renowned uh, plastic you know, surgeon Dr. and uh, what we did, uh, at least from UC Davis side, there's extensive line. talk about it from the other side. Okay. So uh, bronchial blur fistula, this is a, some say, for thoracic surgery point of view, it's a very complicated problem. The reason why is that, you know, the, and uh, in usually the, the, during sarcotomy, they actually transect the latissimus muscles. This is a very challenging problem. So, and uh, and uh, and uh, so uh, uh, over the years, I, I uh, we figured out a way to use a contralateral latissimus muscle and uh, hook into the axilla right here, and uh, and and then and put the muscle, entire muscle, into the chest, and uh, and uh, and uh, to to take care of this kind of problem. Taking a look at it is much more difficult because uh, imagine a patient in a prone position digging the axilla to the microvascular anastomosis. As you can see, this is a very large kind of a, a latissimus flap with a, a skin, a large skin pedal, and this is the flap that second. And this is actually a completion of the microvascular anastomosis in the axilla. With a patient in a prone position have to dig into the axilla, and uh, it's not easy. And uh, sometimes you cannot even get a microscope in a certain angle. And uh, then. Once you finish an microvascular anastomosis, you deepithelialize the flap. This is a very healthy uh, the tissue. And then the urinary thoracic surgeon will uh, uh, repair the uh, bronchial pleural fistula side, you already use uh, some, uh, some uh, fascia, uh, uh, fascia, and then put uh, this in the, 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 the entire very well skewed inside uh, uh, the chest. Uh, put some sutures inside of the flap and then close the chest. This is something that and we take care of this kind of very complex uh, bronchopleural fistula. You can see here as the patient had uh, uh, and healed uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, results. <coughs> Cervical esophageal reconstruction, we have done qu quite a few with Dr. David Cook's service. Uh, this is a patient had a, 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 like a, like a like a, like a circumferential cervical esophageal defect, you can see here. This is something from plus 30 point of view is a two problem. One is reconstruct the cervical esophagus. The other thing is to cover the neck wound. There's a two kind of problems. So for this patient, uh, we designed a, a, an ALT flap because ALT flap basically just scar. It, it made almost no donor side problem. And, uh, and uh, you can see here, we make a, like, a, like a tube. You can actually suture the well, uh, 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 pedicle still connected. And uh, then this is that uh, once you divide the pedicle, your, your, your tube with kind of flat is ready to go. And then you usually that uh, are exposed to the uh, internal memory artery in the vein or neck vein, uh, neck vessels somewhere. And uh, then you can see this is the uh, basically new cervical esophagus. And, uh, and then on the top of that, we do, uh, usually uh, uh, elevate the pack major flap to, to close this wound, skin graft. Yeah, so this is the result. This patient healed this kind of cervical uh, esophagus reconstruction. You can see the barium swallow test, a patent kind of a cervical esophagus. 
this is another case that is a little, uh, little complicated because it's a total esophageal reconstruction. This patient actually uh, had a, a, a stage three, I believe, uh, and uh, esophageal cancer and uh, had a surgery and actually, uh, at, and, and he's been cancer free. It's, a, it's, a, it's amazing. The patient had been uh, 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 initially been counseled at UCSF and uh, and for some reason, you said a turnaround. This patient that came to UC Davis. So this patient that uh, you can see got frozen abdomen. There are not very many options. And uh, so for this patient, uh, uh, and uh, and uh, we uh, you know we designed a very large uh, a radio forearm flat. You know, as you can see here, 18 centimeter, and you can see step by step dissection, make a tube, get a watertight closure. This is actually the uh, new uh, esophagus. And then you tunnel under the sternum, and, uh, and and the surgical oncology service that did both uh, proximal and uh, this is distal and also proximal anastomosis. This is cervical es esophagus did anastomosis. Once they finish that, and the plus surgery team did the uh, 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 microvascular uh, anastomosis, this is the artery to the uh, transverse cervical artery, and also this is toward the uh, branch from the uh, external jugular vein. And uh, so, and uh, once again, this is a radiated wound, and also, uh, and uh, we elevated the uh, pack major muscle flap to cover this and radiated wound. This is a case, uh, to a long case, took a long time for both services. And uh, you know what happened for this patient? And uh, uh, about seven days, patient developed some redness in this area, and uh, you know, it obviously, and uh, is alert for. Uh, uh, the uh, the um, uh, anastomal leak, and uh, and uh, so uh, so we uh, uh, took patient back, opened this area. You can see here dehaces of the cervical uh, a proximal cervical esophageal anastomosis. This is the stump of cervical esophageal. This is a flap. Initially, I thought it's a problem with flap. Actually, flap actually heal, uh, actually is is fine. And this is actually almost a centimeter kind of a, a dehaces. Usually, what we treat the, the traditionally just uh, do a, put the patient the, uh, the TPN and uh, do a dressing change and uh, the, the low, uh, and uh, so so since we have a muscle here, so this is a pec major muscle. This is a, a uh, 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 scleral muscular muscle. So this is something that came out of the idea to use both muscle to 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 close to to kind of kind of uh, uh, cover the anastomal leak side. So hopefully they can actually uh, heal the leak side. So this is actually put a drain there. And this patient actually later on healed this kind of leak side. It's actually a result, and uh, he's actually able to eat, and uh, he's very happy. He's actually uh, this uh, very good citizen. He's a primary uh, uh, detective from San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, another total esophageal reconstruction. So recently, and I worked with Dr. Cook, uh, a, a team, and uh, this is something that, and uh, and uh, we uh, uh, they proposed this is kind of supercharged jejunal flap. You can see you jejunum. It's a pretty extensive operation, uh, and uh, too so use actually jejunum and uh, pedicle the jejunum and uh, and and this uh, distal part of uh, uh, anastomosis of the stomach and proximal to the cervical esophagus. However, this part usually is a very skimmy part, so, so we actually uh, supercharge as a means for this flap. Uh, for this uh, reconstruction is that actually the hook, the superficial, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the uh, mesentery artery and the vein to the, uh, to the uh, ureted internal mammary artery and the vein here. This is the way to Im improve the ischemia in the distal part of this pedicle flap. And uh, so this is actually the uh, uh, completion of microvascular anastomosis is the, the uh, venous anastomosis, arterial anastomosis to the internal memory artery and vein. I usually at a very high level, like a second in the cost plate. This is actually the, uh, the, 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 the uh, appearance the uh, uh, Dr. Cook service finished the uh, cervical esophageal anastomosis. This is actually the uh, uh, jejunum. Okay, you can see here nice kind of uh, uh, anastomosis and, uh, and uh, so this is actually the service involved. Got many, many surgeons uh, in this uh, pictures that uh, you can see here. And this, this patient had well healed kind of uh, wound here, and a barren soil test patent uh, 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 reconstructed the uh, uh, esophagus. Uh, so this is a patient abdominal wall reconstruction for ventral hernia. It's one of the burn patient, and uh, Doctor John has sent the patient to me. and said, "Hey, they got the kind of ventral hernia here, and uh, and this is the burn patient, and uh, you cannot move tissue very much. You really have to do the free tissue transfer. And uh, this is a you can see here, Doctor Anderson finished the mash placement, and you can have a cover this kind of a." Uh, uh, and uh, uh, open area with a good soft tissue. So for this patient, I uh, did uh, uh, abdominal wall reconstruction. Uh, and the, I did the latissimus dorsi uh, myocutaneous flap to put, uh, hook into the uh, uh, internal membrane artery in the vein. You can see the results. And you can see uh, this is a burn patient and then uh, healed the ventral hernia uh, repair site. Uh, 
very common we got called from the, the orthopedic surgery service uh, to take care of some of the very complex uh, problems. Uh, it's not just because the, uh, uh, the uh, 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 microvascular uh, uh, treat you transfer issues, but also very common, and uh, there's no good recipient vessel. This is something that, uh, uh, and uh, you know, we have to come out some kind of innovative way uh, to take care of the problem. For example, uh, this is the OSB trauma surgery. Uh, they want to do this is a patient developed uh, from the uh, uh, femur fracture and developed heterotopic uh, ossification. So basically, cannot even move the hip joint. And the orthopedic surgeon decided to do the total hip replacement to, to resect this kind of a dead uh, 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 the, uh, the femur. So, however, this is something that they are uh, they run into the uh, problem of soft tissue carpal issues. You can see here that once it opens up, it's going to be a big kind of open wound that need a very good tissue. Uh, to, provide, uh, to cover this kind of wound. However, usually this kind of patient that had a previous uh, the uh, pelvic fracture injury, and uh, the, the, the uh, radiologist usually do interventional uh, kind of uh, interventional uh, uh, radiology to pr perform some kind of vascular uh, uh, embolization in this area. So it's really no good receiving vessel if you try to do the free to transfer in this area. However, patient. Uh, uh, does need a large sort of tissue, a large amount of tissue for reconstruction. So for this patient, uh, uh, you know, what we did is like, uh, you know, we had to create a recipient vessel. So this is something that we create, uh, basically the, use a decent branch of the lateral femoral circumflex vessel. So you can see here, we're familiar with this vessel. So I dissect this vessel all the way, you can see here, all the way, and, and to make as a kind of recipient vessels, and then, and then tunnel under the vasolateral right here. So you can see that you can do anastomosis right here. So it's much easier to do. And, the, and the harvest the latissima flap. And you can see here, this is under the microscope, the uh, uh, venous and arterial anastomosis. And then they completed the total hip uh, uh, replacement. We finished the, uh, uh, the, the soft tissue inside. So this is actually a result before and after. And this is another uh, pelvic uh, trauma patient, and uh, and you can see here large soft tissue wound with pelvic ring fracture. You can see here they already did the the, uh, internal, uh, the fixation for fracture site. Uh, this is the same thing. This is the area they did uh, the uh, vascular emboliz the embolization already. It's uh, very hard to get a good receiving vessels. If you, however, a patient uh, does require large soft tissue. You can see here for reconstruction. So this patient I did the same thing. And uh, and uh, uh, basically dissect the decent branch of lateral circum uh, uh, la lateral femoral circumflex vessels to f to swing over to, to go to, to to get very close to the pelvic area and then uh, this is the latissimus latissimus we thought had long pedicle you can see here actually and this is the way you can see good flow from the uh, uh, created the recipient vessels here and they did a very uh, relatively easy. Uh, end to end uh, microvascular anastomosis. And uh, you can see here, it closes everything skin graft. This is a pretty large pelvic wound. And uh, however, this patient developed a distal uh, uh, a flap necrosis. It's not because of uh, it's a vascular issue. It's really because uh, 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 he uh, also had a, 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 the a lumbar spine fracture. And uh, the, the neurosurgeon put a very kind of a long, like a very rigid kind of a brace to, to, to hold it the, for, the, for, the, for the spine fracture. So that brace compresses the distal part of the flap. So this guy has a problem. So we debris the, uh, the flap. And uh, and uh, and and uh, did a, a freestyle pedicle perforated flap. So you can see here. This is a, we don't know the name of this word. That's what I call freestyle. You elevate it. You can see this is based on one large perforator. You can make it as an island flap like this, and then to close. This is actually from a, a freestyle uh, perforated flap, local uh, local flap. And this is still the tissue flap skin uh, skin pedal. And this patient healed very nicely. And for the results. And. Uh, you know, for, for this large kind of a lower thigh wound, it's very complicated. I'm telling you, if you've done free flight, you know, it's a very difficult to find a good receiving vessels. And, and, and not, not, the, not, not only because of trauma issues, it's just that the, normally the, all the vessels are very deep. And so for this patient, uh, uh, we also did uh, it's a large ALT flap, a nice dissection for the, for the perforator, and uh, this is a pedicle. And uh, we also elevate the descending branch of a lateral femoral circumferential vessel, just elevate it so you create this kind of receiving vessels and they're pretty easy and they can do the uh, both arterial venous anastomosis and this is actually result after inset and uh, the skin graft is area that's a lot healed, very large complex lower thigh wound, yeah. 
So uh, for that, this knee wound, you know, if you have done a lot of reconstruction for knee, it's a quite a difficult the same thing. If a, a knee wound larger than five by five centimeters, it's harder to find a, 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 a if you have a free tube transfer, it's hard to find a good receiving vessels in the area. And uh, this, this is a patient that had a very a gunshot uh, wound to the lateral knee. And uh, initially, uh, we were planning to do a reverse ALT flap to cover the knee wound. Uh, unfortunately, when we dissect the pedicle, you see here, when they the, the, uh, fix a fracture, this pin hit the pedicle right here. So we had to change the plan. And uh, so, uh, you know, for this patient, we found a some some kind of small perforator. We don't know the name of the perforator. We did a quite a bit dissect. You can see uh, once you, this is a dissect of pedicle. See, this is very small. This might be just a 1.1, 1.2 millimeter vessel. Very very small. Taking a challenge. This is what we call a freestyle free flap. So, and uh, we did a. a uh, Microbacin and asthma, uh, the venous anastomosis, uh, 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 cooked Doppler, uh, end to side uh, arterial anastomosis right here. Very small, it's very hard. So this patient uh, uh, has a very relatively small lumen, so you, uh, every single stage really count to make it the, 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 the flap works. And you can see this is the result, the flap completely survived. Uh, this is the results uh, about the five, six weeks later. Uh, this is a patient that uh, we treated re very recently. With this kind of ex, uh, uh, injury, very extensive injury, not only for soft tissue point of view, you see, see that bigger bony gap here from the uh, distal tibia, and also to take a look about the the, uh, the, the vascular anatomy. So, uh, so this is the uh, uh, posterior tibial artery, perineal vessel all transected, uh, gone. The patient only have a one single foot. So this is a, an a anterior tibial vessel. For usually for this kind of patient, and uh, I usually try not to do any endocyte anastomo to the anterior tibial vessel because anterior tibial vessel is usually small, and uh, and uh, so I always think about there's something I can use the stump of the of the posterior tibial artery. If you can use it, it'll be much easier. However, it's very deep usually for the for the uh, for the, uh, for the pedicle dissection. For for this patient, I did a two stage procedure. First stage, I rotate the uh, medial gastro as a pedicle flap cover the upper third of a leg wound and also dissect the uh, posterior tibial artery and, and the vein. This is kind of a transect. It's actually just a, a stump right a, above the level of injury to make sure this vessel is okay. So this is something that I did the first kind of uh, operation. I waited about uh, two days and, this, and I did a, a latissimus flap for reconstruction. So this uh, patient actually uh, uh, went reasonably well. And uh, however, and, uh, and uh, what happened to this patient is the post-op day five, you see day five, we should bypass this kind of a critical time. And uh, this patient had uh, a vessel thrombosis. And uh, the reason why that, and, uh, uh, that happened was because he had uh, infected, uh, the other, uh, he had infected uh, 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 the, the hematoma under the knee and then had a spiking fever. So I had a severe fever, hypotension. So then the flap went down. So as you can see, I, I was, uh, so you can see the flap, both arterial venous aspirin thrombosis, you can see here. I was able to revise it technically, however, and, and there's just a thrombosis. Again, patient actually in the recovery room was both vessels of thrombosis. And this is something that, uh, there's something wrong about this patient. So later on, so what happened, why we lost first free flap? And it's actually, uh, the patient had this kind of a thrombocytosis because uh, he had a, uh, 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 splenectomy had a sky a very high kind of level of the platelets and uh, and and also had a hypotensive episode we have both combination kill the flaps it's actually not a technical part so so for this patient we did a quite a bit of kind of a uh, kind of a, 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 a thinking and asked uh, quite a few experts in the hospital and uh, later on and uh, and uh, one day I was asking for uh, uh, our pathologists here that, that they are off they uh, recommend this uh, phoresis kind of service I said wow they have this kind of phoresis service and uh, this is something that, that uh, so what we did is actually patient underwent the kind of phoresis to remove the platelet you know, I'll show it to, so this is something we control all the risk uh, uh, risk factor for for the flat failure, obviously make sure blood pressure will be stable, no, no hematoma, in fact, hematoma, everything, everything. So we did a second free tube muscle transfer. And obviously the second is much more difficult and uh, it's usually about, uh, at that time, about five, six weeks range and, uh, and all, a, lot of, uh, a lot of scar tissue uh, along the artery and both in the uh, recipient vessels. And you can see here, this is actually, we did, uh, uh, this is actually the uh, after series of debridement uh, 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 washout and, uh, and, uh, and you can see here, this is a wound, let's we'll take out the, uh, uh, the, the, the the hardware everything, everything yeah and anyway so so this is the stump of the both uh, uh, posterior artery the vein was much deeper and higher and I was able to do a 
kind of a, a okay microassay and small articular very challenging and because it's not optimal it's inside the hole and uh, so we managed did the microassay and osmosis and you can see this patient actually uh, and, 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 and work well. So, so what happened for this patient is because we learned, and uh, you know, after the a splenectomy, and uh, when we do a first free flight, that he has a re basic reactive kind of a thrombocytosis. And uh, uh, however, even visit under this kind of consideration, it still it also works. However, on the uh, on the top of that, patient had a hypotension. Hypotension really the you know, two combination so kill the flaps. You can see here later on before the second free tissue transfer, we did the apheresis. You can see down to. Uh, down to the, the 200 something uh, uh, thousand level, and then we did a second free flap. So this patient actually, the second free flap works. However, actually, do you see the plate that rebound back to 600 range? We did a second uh, and the third uh, apheresis. Sometimes we have no literature to support. We just had to say, hey, we'll probably do it two more times and be safe, so the patient won't have any problem. So anyway, so this is actually did a second. Uh, there's a big, uh, like a free rectus muscle fly, you can see here inside, and they can see this is the result, just 11 months. This patient later had a bone graft, actually had a, 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 a leg, yeah. Uh, another patient had a very complex uh, foot ankle injury, you can see here, and uh, uh, this is something that, yeah, usually the, if an orthopedic surgeon think uh, it's worthwhile to put a, a fracture bone together, and, uh, and, and we, as a plastic surgeon, we can actually uh, do a fairly good in, in terms of the co to cover soft tissue. And the, the, for this patient, another big ALT flap, and you can see here, nice pedicle dexterity patient, single, single, a single perforator, and, uh, and uh, this is the uh, endosan anastomosis for the artery, and, uh, and also venous anastomosis, all these couple of devices. This is a result on the table, and uh, this has a result uh, in a few months later, well healed. And this is actually donor side for ALT flap. It's so very minimal. It's a very contemporary kind of reconstruction. Uh, so this is the last case. This is a patient had a, a, a deglove injury of the dorsal of the foot with exposed uh, at the uh, te a, a, a tendons and also the fracture side. The, the, the orthopedic surgeon did a plate. Uh, this is a very large kind of wound. This kind of uh, a patient, uh, and uh, you know, uh, you know, initially I decided to do a large ALT flap. Can we design the ALT flap? Unfortunately, due to flap dissection, that pedicle was uh, the peripheral was not reliable. We found a little per this peripheral on the side is much more reliable. So we basically chased this uh, the pedicle to 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 this to this one. We felt like we have an adequate length of the pedicle and also the. Uh, uh, you know, the side of the vessel is okay for microacinosis. So that's what we call a freestyle. We, freestyle. We don't know even the name of the vessel. So we did. Uh, so so this is actually uh, uh, after the flap inside. You can see it's uh, this results uh, several months later. Yeah. So how to optimize the uh, uh, outcome in free to transfer? I think the hospital support is very important and. Uh, you know, you know, you know, you know. I think a hospital really should uh, 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 acknowledge the importance of such a unique service. This is one thing, and also provide a, a proper and, a, and, a, and sometimes advanced equipment and also instruments. And also, you should really establish some kind of a, a good post-op care unit. So this is the 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 only microsurgery ICU I know uh, on this plan. It's actually at the Chang'e Memorial Hospital in Taiwan. They have a 26 by the microsurgery ICUs. Because of this. Uh, they were able to perform about 100, more than 100,000 free tissue transfer the last 30 years. So this is, and also many like finger replant, uh, leg replant, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. And also the team is very important. And uh, you know, we need to have a really a surgeon team, a resident fellows team, and also the anesthesia team is very important. You know, this is something that we don't, uh, unlike a CT surgery, vascular surgery, we don't have a microvascular surgery team. So we also got the sometimes random kind of anesthesiologist, you know, he's a, you know, he or she does not know free to transfer that well. And, and, and obviously, the OR team is a very important, post op care team is very important. This is something I felt is very important. This is the, the case you can see many residents involved in this kind of micro uh, uh, vascular free transfer. Scientific change is very important. I think this is something that over the years I went to the Chang'e Memorial Hospital in Taiwan, Bunky Clinic, uh, University of Tokyo. This is the Koshima, the founder of the DIP flap, and uh, uh, NYU, and the most recently University of Basel, Switzerland, and also Asso Medical Center in South Korea. So this is something you know, I go there, I give a lecture on free to transfer, and also I learn because this is all the centers of excellence for microvascular free transfer. I learned so much. I tell you, so it's unbelievable. And sometimes you say you teach, you learn. This is something that is very, uh, uh, very, very unique experience. 
So in conclusion, uh, I think a microbiome free transfer indeed can play a very important role in many contemporary complex reconstruction, as you can see. And the microsurgical service that provide uh, more support to academic medical center for uh, any complex surgical procedures is something I will actually uh, show to you. Uh, uh, I think academic medical center cannot accomplish a mission without a very active, a strong microsurgery uh, service. And uh, you know, obviously we actually uh, hope uh, adequate support from uh, uh, to such service from hospital or department uh, is a very critical develop a strong uh, microsurgical service. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer your question. Thank you. I'll tell you, it's an excellent idea. I'll tell you, last, at uh, that time when we actually faced this kind of problem, we looked at literature, really no good kind of uh, literature to tell you what it's supposed to do. And the only thing, you know, we know because we see the plate laid in a very high level, and also we see the plate laid uh, uh, intraop. So it's something, I think it may be a good idea if, uh, if you can come out some kind of something to block the function of the plate laid. It would be great, yeah. It's a, it's a, I think you probably should do some research for that. And there's a lot of work being done um, on endothelial manipulation um, that we can kind of, Dr. Lee is doing, Dr. Wang is doing, Dr. Wong is doing some work, lots of uh, folks have put this group together to think about that. That's a great talk. I have um, a theoretical question. Uh, is there something that you think Uh, it, it is uh, is a very difficult question, and uh, it's uh, it's, it's uh, I, I think it's uh, two ways. One is that you have you had a team, and also you have a, a entire hospital for support, and uh, this is a very critical. Uh, microsurgery is a, is a long is a, is a really long haul in terms of the you know to the operating room. Uh, you know you know you know it's a it's a it's a very it's very. Uh, uh, a very challenging as well because the vessel is so small. You only have a you know this this opportunity to, to make it work. And once you miss that opportunity, it may not work that well because of it, uh, uh, it is difficult. And uh, you know I hope uh, we can elevate you know in, in you know the, the level of uh, of uh, uh, expertise and also uh, I think if any hospital can provide this microsurgical reconstructive service and uh, that saves us open heart surgery and uh, you know, for the hospital, you know, this hospital really means something. I think that's something that, you know, pretty obvious. If a hospital say, I can do open heart surgery, I cannot do microvascular, and, uh, you, know, is, uh, you know, in my opinion, you're, you're missing something. I think that's Yeah. Uh, 
our vessel, the size of vessel we're dealing with usually from 1.5 to 2.5 millimeter. That's a vessel. And uh, we haven't tried to use artificial uh, o -O -O aloe graft because we always can harvest the vein grafts. Yeah. I think so, and as you can see, if you design flat well, you don't even have to use vein graft. You know, see something that, you know, we came out with the idea to how to create a recipient vessel. That's something that uh, is, is important. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's good. If you can uh, do it, some people de device. develop some device, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a, but it's still it's an experimental stage. And uh, you know, as a surgeon, we still, you know, and uh, you had to you had to figure out how to do, to do a sense, you know, to the, to to do the hands on micro mic mic most of it. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.